welcome once again. We are back in reviewing practice questions for ISC2 certified in cybersecurity. And today, like we've been doing, we are looking at another domain in CompTIA, uh, another domain in certified in cybersecurity. Today's domain is domain three, which is the access control concepts. And we have six questions to review within a few minutes. So, as always, we are trying to explain how you approach the questions explain the answer so that we can have a grasp of what it means you know, to take this exam in regards to each of these domains have been looking at. The first question we are looking at is which security principle states that a user should only have the necessary permission to execute a task? So there are different principles in security, you know, in cyber security and there are different principles that are dictates how big things are done so for this we are looking at what principle is looking at permissions to execute a tax so the first option we have is privileged accounts which is the principle of privileged accounts b principle of separation of duties c principle of least privilege and d principle of defense in depth so if you look at it which one sounds like a principle that is controlling or limiting permission to execute a task. Let's see the answer and explain. So the principle is principle of least privilege. So if you look at the three uh, the four options we have privilege accounts is a principle we're talking about privilege you know that someone has to access an account. Then we have privilege or separation of duties that's separate. Then we have the least privilege which means someone with the least you have the least uh, permission to do certain things. So the principle of least privilege dictates that users should be granted only the minimum level of access or permissions. This is that is needed to perform their job function. That people will not be granted permission more than the function they want to do. Uh, like I always explain, a, a front desk officer will not have the permission to access the staff payroll because. Is jump their jump functions are quite different so this reduces the risk of unauthorized access accidental changes or exploitation by attackers for example a regular employee should not have administrative rights on their workstation unless absolutely necessary so this one if you're looking at ISIS 2 study guide this will be dealt with in chapter 1 module 3 which is access control so the next question we are looking at is which of these is not a best practice in access management? A. Periodically accessing or periodically assessing whether user permissions still apply. Periodic requesting option B is requesting a justification when upgrading permission. Option C giving only the right amount of permission. D trust but verify so which of this is not a best practice so we are talking about what is not the emphasis is what is not a best practice so if you look at the options let's see answer says d trust but verify which means you are trusting before verifying so it's supposed to be the other way around so why trust but verify must sound reasonable it is not a recognized best practice in former access management framework instead the principle of least privilege, which is and regular audits are emphasized. Best practices include periodically reviewing permissions, which is option A, requiring justification for elevated access, which is option B, granting only access permissions, which is option C, then relying on trust without continuous verification can lead to privilege creep and insider trust. So trust but verify is saying that you trust before verify so relying on that is not doing that is not a best practice in access management the third question which of these users is less likely to have a privileged account a, a system administrator b a security analyst c a help desk d an external worker so we are looking at which one is less likely to have a privileged account? Like, you know, privileged account is talking about having privileges to carry out more functions. So, if you are saying privileged account, which of these 
ones by their role you know system administrator has a lot of roles security analysts higher role help desk will probably higher role external worker so let's look at the option the answer external worker obviously an external worker is expected to be someone that is not internal to the organization so which means privileged accounts are typically assigned to internal personnel only who require elevated access for system management or security monitoring system administrators security analysts and even help desk who may reset password or manage accounts you know External workers such as contractors or third-party vendors are generally granted only the minimum access required for their specific task and are less likely to be given full privilege accounts due to increased risk of exposure. Of course, someone that is external to your organization can go out there and do anything with the permission. So you have to restrict them to what they need the access for. Let's look at the next question it is, according to the principle of separation of duties, no user should be given enough privileges to misuse the system on their own. What is the primary goal of this principle? Which is, the primary goal of this principle, what is it? A. Increase operational efficiency. B. Prevent fraud and errors. C. User training. D. Reduce hardware cost. So what, what is the primary goal? So the question here is the primary goal is what we are looking at, what we are looking for. So let's see the options we have here. The correct answer is to prevent B, which is to prevent fraud and error. So if you are looking at preventing fraud and error, separation of duties ensures that no single individual has complete control over a critical process, which means if a process is critical, you have to go give permission i mean control to more than one person so one person will not just decide to you know execute a critical process there will be different levels of permission required for that to happen so this is reduced this thereby reduce the risk of malicious actions or mistake going undetected so if someone misses it the second person the other person should not miss it for example one person might in initiate a financial transaction while another must approve it this check and um, checks and balance mechanism is crucial for financial system so accessing provisioning and change management so this helps to control you know frauds and errors in uh, situations or in an organization so let's see uh, we have another question here which of the following is a technical access control which of the following is a technical access control? Option A, fences. B, turn, turn styles. C, bollards. D, access control list. So the, the idea here is you need to understand what each of them means. So what does a fence mean? Do you know what a fence is? Do you know what a turn style is? You, do you know what a bollards bo bo are? Do you know what access control lists are? So if you don't know the, the meaning of these things, you will not be able to answer this question. You know a fence is built around. Turn tile is what that, uh, if you are entering to a building, it allows one person per time to in, you know, by, through rotation. Then bollards are like uh, pillars, you know, short, short pillars that are used to prevent, you know, uh, restrict movement in, in, form, in a way. Then access control lists, these are configurations you know that you do in a system so of course from the way it sounds from you understanding what these things mean you already know which one is a technical access control so let's reveal the answer d of course because when we're talking about setting configurations you know you know that's technical so access control lists which are acs are technical logical controls used in operating systems and network devices to define which users or system can access specific resources in contrast, fences, turn sides, and bullets are physical security controls designed to restrict physical access to facilities. So the, uh, what we learn there is to know the meaning of those terms. Then the last question we are treating here is, what is the purpose of an acceptable use policy in access control? So we all know acceptable use policy is basically dictating the conditions for using, you know, a particular software, a particular application, or a particular uh, resource. So, 
acceptable use policies are policies that are guiding you know this the way uh these resources are being used so what is the purpose of this acceptable use policy one to define how employees can use personal devices at work b to outline data encryption standards c to specify permissions and limitations for accessing organizational resources organizational resources and d to establish incident response procedures already we've explained what acceptable use policy are so let's reveal the answer to specify permissions and limitations for accessing organizational resources so an acceptable use policy defines the rules and expectations for users when accessing an organization's networks systems and data it typically includes prohibitions or unauthorized software, personal use of system and sharing credentials. Users must agree to the AUP before being granted access, making it a key administrative access control. So even sometimes some software, when you download and you want to install on your system, for ethical purposes, they will give you AUP policies that you must, that you must click, just like you have privacy policy that you must you know, accept you know, in some websites. So some applications when you are downloading and installing, just AUP policy, you must agree to it before you are allowed to make use of it. Once again, thank you for joining me. I have 75 practice questions I'm giving out for free. So if you are preparing for this exam, it will do you a lot of help. If you access these 75 questions uh, for free, just type success blueprint in the comment section and i will send you uh, a link where you can fill a form and then access these 75 questions for free and i also have a kit called cyber security success blueprint kit it contains a whole lot more than 75 practice questions we have questions there for ic to certify in cyber security we have questions there for computer security plus we have an ebook that I've put together that narrates the experience how i passed my exams in with less than 30 days preparation and how you can also pass the exam it contains links to resources so where that you can find jobs how to prepare your cv for job the whole lot packed into these kits and it's available on the website too cyber success tools dot xyz just go to the website you know access this cyber security success blueprint kit and you are your way to go once again don't forget like this video subscribe to this channel and share this information with everyone in your space that you know have a good need of it thank you see you for the next domain